Starting in 2016, we were kind of enlisted to go on mission trips because we had some bilingual people here specifically. Not because that's all we had to offer. I obviously speak about three quarters of a language pretty well. So, uh, Araceli, on our mission trips, the best translator that's ever there. No one knows what her first language is, and that's a pretty hard thing to do. Um, we've had some really good translators from here and actually had some that couldn't go because of COVID. Um, in 2020, of course, everything shut down, and the guy who was really in charge of the mission trips for us, um, at, at least the part that we were involved in, he passed away. Um, he had, I think it was pancreatitis, and he, he was having some health problems, and he passed away. And, um, and so it's, it's been one of those works that we've been hoping to get back into. Uh, well, a couple of months ago, I received uh, some communications, some phone calls, and uh, the, uh, the mission work uh, that we would go on was called the Yes To, which is Young Evangelistic Servants, and it was under sort of the umbrella of what's called Latin America Missions, which is overseen by the Forest Park Church in Valdosta, Georgia. And so someone reached out to me, an old friend of mine from college, who's the preacher there, and he said, he said, would you like to do some more work with Latin America missions? And of course, it's kind of been not, it hasn't really existed for two years. And I said, well, sure, I'll help out any way I can. And he said, well, how about full time? And immediately, immediately I thought, well, I'm a, I'm a preacher. That's not really what I do, but sure, I'll, you know, I'll talk with you about it, right? And so pretty quickly... What I learned was that it was a great opportunity and something that is, personally, I'm more excited about that opportunity than really I ever thought that I would be. They have invited me to come visit them next week to talk about it. And I want you to pray for the Lord's will. Uh, this is my home. I've been here 13 years I'm a preacher. Georgia's not my home. I was actually born in Georgia, but I've never lived there. It's not my home, and if I go there, I wouldn't be preaching. But I've been, pr I've been praying to God for a long time, a simple prayer. Just, just use me. Use me in whatever way uh, can benefit the kingdom the most. And so it's difficult for me to look at this opportunity and think that uh, it's not God maybe answering that prayer. And while I don't want to leave, and I'll probably, if I do, I probably won't be able to stand up here and talk. <laughs> and so I, I want you to pray about that, about um, the eldership there and about this opportunity and the decisions that will be made. Um, I've talked to them some already, and, and if we come to an agreement, if we iron things out, um, it's probably something that'll happen quickly uh, because of sort of the time frame that they're on and the expectations and the plans that they want. And so um, I've been talking to quite a few of you about this. I haven't been withholding this from anyone, but I wanted to just tell you, you're my church family. You're, you're my family, and I love all of you very much. And I, just, I want your prayers. Um, and even if I do go, you're still my family. You're still my church family. And um, I would... I would consider it going to be sort of a, a mission work that you have launched me into. And, uh, and so I just need your prayers. Uh, I don't really have a lesson this morning. I mean, unless you, you know, count this as a lesson, but uh, I don't know what I want to say. But I have a lot to say. Last week, uh, Sebastian and I on Sunday... As we were there working with the evangelism campaign at just a regular run-of-the-mill congregation, they, they, have, uh, they said they had about 220 people on Sunday morning. Not much bigger than this, this place. They have, uh, uh, those who do what's called the school of evangelism there, they have a, a, a book that's called Evangelism Simplified, which is sort of, a, uh, it's one, some that we've had out here on the table that some of you have. And it is, a, 
in written form, an abbreviation of the evangelism seminar. And Sebastian and I were, were asked to come early. Can you be here at 815 to hand these out to people who come in? And they gave us a big stack of them, and they said, okay, y'all go back to the back corner, and anybody that comes through that entrance, you make sure they have one of these. And people try to sneak past us. I'll tell you, y'all are sneaky. For a while, there was nobody coming, and we were just twiddling our thumbs forever. And then people kept coming and kept coming. We sat back there during class. We sat back there, ended up sitting back there for the worship service, even though we, we had planned to sit somewhere else. In fact, when we go to like polishing the pulpit and things like that, our group tends to sit on the front row, typically not because we're there early, but because, because most people who get there early don't sit on the front row, and so it's usually available, and that kind of became our thing. And so I asked Sebastian, where are we going to sit? He's like, well, our thing is sitting on the front row, so that's what we did all week. But we ended up on the back row because we were handing these out. Beautiful, big, brand new building. Wonderful acoustics. There were those who were there who were from out of town. So, you know, it was somewhere between 250 to 300 people there. Sebastian and I, we sing out. We sing loud. We're sitting on the back, and it was like dead silence back there. We could hardly hear anything. We were singing as loud as we could because that's kind of just how we are, right? But we didn't hear really anybody singing. And I looked around, kind of in amazement, and people's mouths weren't moving. As we went through the service, they had uh, the last couple of rows, and I think Anuseli was on the back row handing out books, and she gave me the same report from her side, that there were kids who were just kind of allowed to be animals, essentially, and just do whatever they want to do, and run around, and whatever. And I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus. I doubt the people that I'm going to talk about care enough that they would ever even know I talked about them. I'm not going to say anybody by name. But this is what I observed. We're having a worship service, just like right now. And there's kids running around being unparented. Being unparented. And they have a mother and a father sitting there. A couple of kids in front of me. A couple of kids down the pew from me here. Long pew. And as the, the kid was in the middle of our worship service, the kids really, as they were just doing whatever they wanted to do, being as loud as they wanted to be, not engaging in what we were doing, not being told, now this is what we're going to do now, and being parented and instructed. They were just allowed to do whatever they wanted to do. And the parents, you know what they were doing? They were just had big smiles on their faces. They were just watching their kids and were just as proud as they could be. Look at my child, this untamed animal. Look, I don't have kids, all right, but I can observe things. Anytime a child is misbehaving, you know what? I don't ever blame the child. I blame the parents. If you have children that misbehave, it is because you have not trained them. It's as simple as that. Well, I watched it. I watched it. Now, it doesn't stop there because this is generational. All right? This is generational. You have a husband and a wife. They're sitting there, and they're just they're so proud of their kids who have apparently not have in, had any instruction in their entire lives, have not been disciplined ever, probably never been spanked, and I mean, it looked like it too. I'm surprised they weren't foaming at the mouth. They were like wild animals. The parents are sitting there just as proud as can be of their feral animal children. Next to them were the grandparents. And do you know what they were doing? So proud of my kids and my grand. They were just as proud. And I'm thinking, oh, well, they've been trained to act this way. They were probably just feral animal children. And their parents didn't discipline them or spank them or tell them to do anything. What? We're in an assembly? We're worshiping God? What's a songbook? I don't know. We're, we were supposed to sit on the pew and actually, like, pray with everybody? You mean there's a song that's going on we're supposed to sing? None of them were participating at all. They were being entertained by their kids. Everything that they did in that worship service, they could have done in their living room. I mean, everything. Without worshiping for one second. At a congregation that I love, I made some great friends there. The preacher 
His son is the dean of the graduate Bible department at Freed Hardman University. The elders there. I've known one of them since I was in high school. I didn't even know he was an elder there until I got there and realized it. This congregation has had evangelism seminars. They've had this, which was a, a campaign this week, because they believe in doing what is important and focusing and training, and yet there were still some who were there. There were some who were there, who as I looked at them, all I could think was, do they not believe God? Do they not believe God about anything? And I just sat there and I just started to write. And I don't know if I vented. I don't know if that's what this is. I just began to write. Let me share with you what I wrote. Jesus came to bring us the abundant life. John 10, 10. When we don't trust Him, we lose the abundant life. The people who were sitting in front of me, they were not spiritually mature. They didn't know how to be. They weren't raised to be. They were not trained in the abundant life. They had not been trained to trust God in compliance and obedience, focusing on Him, and they weren't instilling it those in, in the kids. In 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 5, I actually have it here. 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 5, Paul says, what, what then is Apollos? What, what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. And the way that we can understand this simple analogy for our lives is not just evangelistically, but is this. When God says, this is the way to live right here. This is what is important to do. This is important to focus on. And we, and we hear him and we say, you know what? I believe in God. I, I believe in your son. And I think I'll be a Christian. And I think I'll, I'll even go to that building over there where other people who say they're Christians go to. But then you witness people. You witness people who, during a worship service, are not only not engaged, but are just being entertained by children that need to be parented. Who, during a song, their lips don't even move. They don't even care. They, and I look at them and I think, do you believe God? That if you believe Him, you will invest it's the idea of th of believing whether or not if you plant the seed and water the seed that god will bring the increase that all of the things that god has told us do these things do these things and i will grow the abundant life in your midst you will enjoy it and there are so many people who are christians who say yeah, well i'm a christian but in so many areas of their life, they just absolutely do not believe anything that God has told them. Someone who sits in a worship service and doesn't move their mouth when everyone else is singing, you know, Jesus is the creator of everything. We're supposed to sing, and we don't have a right not to. God has told us how to live, and we do not have a right not to do what He said to do. Now, certainly He's given us the freedom to rebel against Him. But if we want to be his followers, we want the abundant life. We want his blessings. We want eternal life. And yet we live in such a way that we are showing him. We are proclaiming by our inaction. I do not believe you, God. Do you know that we are commanded to sing? And that singing would transform your life. Some people say, well, I can't really sing that well. And I don't understand the notes on the page. And... I wasn't raised like you, Karen. I just, I'm not really confident in my voice and things like that. No, that has anything to do with what we're talking about. God said, sing. And when you don't, you know what you're saying? You know what, Lord? I do not think that worship you is, worshiping you is important. I do not think that 
emboldening one another, teaching one another, encouraging one another through song is important. Lifting up your name is important. I do not believe that through worshiping you, that you can transform me. I do not believe it, so I'm not going to do it. So I'm not going to plant the seed or water it because I really don't think you're going to give me the abundant life anyway through this. And so I'm just going to do it my way. And I look at people who sit silently and I just have that question. Do you even believe God? You're robbing yourself. I believe it's Malachi that talks about those who were filling up their money, their money basket or their money bag and it had a hole in the bottom and they could never fill it up. That's the abundant life when you don't believe God. You just have a hole in the bottom of your purse. And the abundant life escapes you and it's elusive. And so I just began to write. I began to write. You won't plant, you won't water if you don't believe the seed's actually going to grow. You, you won't. God says, do this and this will happen. But if you look at that and you say, you know what, I don't think that what God says is going to happen is going to happen, so I'm not going to plant, I'm not going to water. The measure to which you obey depends upon the measure to which you trust God. And the question is, do you really believe Before I get into this, because I made a list. I made a list of things. I just kind of brainstormed. Before I get into that, I, I want to I I read with you. Please go with me to Mark chapter 9 first and Luke chapter 17. I want us to look at a couple of instances that show what I believe is a minority. A minority of a disposition of heart. The first one is in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 14. Mark chapter 9, starting verse 14. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought, you, I brought my son to you. For he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast him out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. Verse 20, Mark 9, 20. And they brought the boy to him, and when the Spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things, if, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes Immediately, the father, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. How often do you say that? How often do you look at your life and you say, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, but Lord... I haven't really been trusting. I haven't really been believing you. I need you to help me in the places I don't trust you. Because I'm holding you back from really transforming my life. Luke 17, starting in verse 1. Luke 17, starting in verse 1. A very similar disposition of heart. Different situation altogether. Luke 17, verse 1. And he said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. 
the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now we have an instance here where it's like, hold on. Now you want us to keep forgiving people? Are you serious? Now your Bible may actually have this sectioned off as different. We don't know if this chronologically happened together. It may very well have been that he tells them to forgive and then they say, increase our faith. The Lord said, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be rooted up and planted into the sea and it would obey you. Increase our faith. One of the things that is, is about having proper goals and proper expectations of success when taking the gospel to individuals is what Jesus says in Matthew twenty two fourteen. Matthew twenty two fourteen says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Certainly, certainly, of all the people in your life right now, if you would do your duty and take the gospel to every single one of them, guess how many that is? That's many. You know, some of you have tried to share the gospel with maybe one or two people, maybe three people in your entire life. And not any of them have obeyed the gospel. You know why? Because you haven't taken the gospel to many. When you take the gospel to just a few people, you know how many you get from that? None. None. Your success rate in converting people in your life doesn't have anything to do with whether or not what you're doing is effective in what you're saying. It, it's the simple fact that you're just not doing enough of it. You're not talking to enough people. You have to go to many to find the few. There are only few. Broad is the gate that leads to destruction. Narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. If you've only talked to a few people, you're not going to convert anybody. You're just not. We understand that concept, but we really need to apply that when we, we're trying to make plans uh, and have proper expectations of what success and failure looks like with evangelism. If you're only going to talk to three people, guess what? That's a failure. Because you're not going to many to find the few. But I want to take a little bit of a spin on this. Something that I have noticed my entire life, and to varying degrees from person to person in different areas of our lives, is that within the church, within the church, you also have those two groups, whether you want to admit it or not. Within the church, you have a group of many, and you have a group of few. And do you know what makes the difference? This is what makes the difference. The many, the many say, I believe. I'm a Christian. I believe. I'm a Christian. But there are very few Christians who say, I believe. But help my unbelief. You see, because we are so convinced that a life that is simple and easy and convenient and doesn't require a lot of work and doesn't require real spiritual goals and sacrifices, that that's what the Christian life is about. And we sit in a worship service and our lips don't even move because we don't trust God enough to know that when He says sing, He's trying to transform your life. But you sit there silent you won't even trust Him. And your life isn't transformed and you're part of the many. But there are few, there are few who say, Lord, I'm, I trust you. But we look at our lives and we say, Lord, but there are so many ways that it's evident that I haven't trusted you. I believe you, Lord, but help my unbelief because I need to be set free from my disbelief. And so that's why we can be like his apostles and say, Lord, increase my faith. Same word, same idea. And so I made a list. I made a list of the areas. We have, we have on the sign out here, we have assembly times. We have assembly times. We are told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, which is the manner of some, but to assemble and to build up and encourage one another unto love and good works. And 
any time, any time that there's an opportunity for us to assemble and we say, you know what, not right now, I got, you know, I got a thing to do, I have some family coming in town and I've got to cut my grass or I just, my steaks are marinating, there's a football game, I don't know, whatever it is, whatever it is. And you say, I'm not going to assemble for whatever reason. And there are, look, there are various things that happen in our lives we don't have control over. But we have a whole lot more control than we admit that we do. When you say, I'm not going to assemble when I know other Christians will assemble, then what you're really saying is, Lord, I don't believe you. I do not believe that my absence will discourage other people. I do not believe that my absence in worshiping together will rob other people from the encouragement that they can have. I do not believe that my absence will rob others of being stirred up unto love and good works. I don't have that much power to encourage and to help others be faithful. I just don't have that. God, you're wrong. I don't have that kind of power. And so what do we do? We come one hour a week. If that, sometimes, that's what people do. That's the kind of person who comes every assembly and sits there and their mouth doesn't move because they don't believe what God said about singing. It's the same thing about assembling. Every time you don't assemble, you're announcing. You're announcing, I believe and I'm good. But you're not confronting yourself and your unbelief. You're not believing what God has said. You need to be saying, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because if you're not coming to the assembly, it's because you actually don't believe God. You know, do you realize that? Now, you may think, What's, man, he's going to burn this building down. But let me tell you something. I may be moving soon, and probably no one's going to ever tell you the truth about this. No one's ever going to tell you the truth. That you're not assembling because you do not believe God. That, do you realize that? We need to be crying out to God, help my unbelief. Help me to trust that what you said you mean. You want to transform my life. You want me to have the abundant life. And yet, week in and week out, we say, I believe. We really don't. We've got it figured. I have it figured out. I have it figured out. I know, I know what I'm supposed to do. Don't tell me how to live. No, I'm not telling you how to live. Jesus created you and he has the right to tell you how to live. And you don't have a right to say no. You simply do not. I do not. I do not have a right to tell him no. I don't have the right. And if you've convinced yourself that you have the right to tell God no, then you don't believe. You don't believe. That was number one on my list. Praying. Do you pray to God? Do you pour your heart out to Him? Do you have a prayer list that is continually being updated? Do you pray with your family and with your spouse? Do you pray with your kids so they can hear you say their name? If you don't, it's because, guess what? You don't believe Him. And you can look at your prayer life. I can look at my prayer life. I've always struggled with this. And I need to say, God, I believe, but help my unbelief. I need to trust Him more when I pray. Look, I'm the preacher. I'm going to be here when we assemble. I'm not going to beat myself up over that, but I can beat myself up over this. I need to pray better. My inactivity in prayer betrays my unbelief. And I need to cry out to God. Help my unbelief. What about giving to the church? You know that nothing you have belongs to you. It's God's money. And He has given it to you as a test to see if you really trust Him or not. Do you purpose ahead of time how much you're going to give to the Lord's work? Do you really? Is it just a matter of convenience that maybe whatever, I have a dollar in my pocket and that's what... Or are you purposing yourself that I actually believe that the gospel is true? That we are the pillar and ground of the truth? That no one has the truth but us and we've got to send it out. We've got to proclaim it. And so you know what? I'm going to help the work of the church with the money that I earn in my secular job. 
And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust God enough that I'm going to give so much that it hurt. I'm going to actually have to, I'm going to have to sacrifice this. I'm going to sacrifice this. I'm going to have to sacrifice this. But I trust, I trust that God is going to meet my needs. I trust him. Because when we don't purpose in giving, what we're really saying is, God, you know what? I don't believe that if I give to you, that I'm going to be okay. I'm trusting myself to earn my way and to put food on the table. I don't trust you, God. I don't trust you. Help my unbelief. What about studying? What about just opening God's Word and not just opening it and closing your eyes and pointing to a passage and reading? I mean, actually understanding. God has revealed Himself to me. This is His heart and His mind. This is the eternal and the divine mind. Do I care? Have I opened it? Have I put it in my heart? Because let me tell you something. I hear a lot of people in this room that tell me things that that proclaim to me they're not in this book, but they are definitely listening to a lot of people in the world. They're, They're listening to a lot of false teachers on the radio and television, stuff like that, putting a lot of nonsense into their heads. I hear a lot of that, but very little wisdom do I hear where people are actually studying God's Word. Do you really believe it can transform your life? The reason you're not studying it is because you do not believe God said it will transform your life. The Word of God is perfect, converting the soul. Do you believe it or not? Because if you look at your life and your study habits and you realize, you know what, I'm just not doing it, then cry out to be the few people who will say, increase my faith. Confront my unbelief, God. My actions have shown that I don't believe you. You know, one of the things we did in this campaign, I, evangelism, let me, t- let me tell you something. The card writing we're doing, visiting that we're doing, things of that sort. There were, how many people were in the, in the, the group? Maybe 60 of us? 60 of us. There were just 60. It's a congregation of 220. And about, there were about 60 of us who were part of the evangelism group. And, only, and about half of those were from the congregation. The other half were from nine different states. We went there and we worked just a few hours on a few days. Just a few hours on a few days. And from the people that we met, we received, we got contact information to follow up with from 25 to 30 percent of those people. Now that's not 100 percent, no, but that's, that's people who are willing to talk to us some more. And so what did we do? We wrote, we wrote, uh, we wrote 1,068 cards in just a few hours over a couple of days to 125 people. We're doing that some here. But we can't send those cards out and not go and visit those people. We met a lady whose sister April has cancer. And I said, can we send your sister April cards here at your address? Yes, yes. Okay, we're going to do that. Guess what? We're going to go back to her house. And what's she going to think about the church when she receives 65 cards? Is she going to think, you know what, I don't really think they care about me. No, she's going to think, this is uh, something that's never happened in my life before. And we're going to ask her a simple question. What do you think about the church there? Do you think she's going to say, well, I really kind of hate their guts? No, she's going to say, they're really wonderful people. I really appreciate them. You know what the next question is? Would you like to know more about the church? You know how how high the likelihood is that they're going to say yes? And you know what that means? That means right then, you can have a Bible study with them. Out on the back table, we have a couple of different types of Bible studies. We have one that's called Back to the Bible that's three booklets, and one that's called Does It Matter? Does it matter what I believe? Does it matter how I worship? Does it matter how I was saved? Does any of that matter? And it's a book that condenses the other three. We'll sit down and we'll show them what the Bible teaches about the authority of Christ and the church of Christ and salvation of Christ. And we'll teach them about the church. 
Do you know what the success rate of Bible studies are when we can get one? 90%. 90% of people that study with these booklets become Christians. 90%. I heard recently that the, uh, the president of Freed Hardman University, who used to be a preacher, was speaking to a room full of about maybe 300 preachers. And he asked the preachers, because look, I'm just as guilty. I'm going to tell you, I'm preaching to myself. He said, how many of you have had a Bible study in the last six months? And only a few of them raised their hands. Do you know what he said? Everybody whose hand isn't up, quit your job. <laughs> just, just fire yourself on the spot. Why would they not do that? Why would they not have a Bible study with someone? Why is it that we would not initiate with someone and would put them on our prayer list and send them cards and then go and visit them and ask them if they'd like to know more about the church who just showed a great amount of love to them, probably in a way they've never experienced before? Because we do not believe that having a Bible study with someone and that the power of the gospel can actually transform a soul. James said in James 1.25, Laying aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, let us receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. We do not teach people or try to have Bible studies with people because we do not believe God. 90% success rate. If you can just get them to a Bible study. And so we need to look at our lives when it comes to evangelism and we've got to say, Lord, help my unbelief. We don't do it because we don't believe. Let me tell you something. The Bible studies sitting back there, they're not going to convert people. The only way we convert people is by getting contacts, by following up with the contacts, and following up with the contacts, and following up with the contacts, and trying to get a Bible study with them. Austin, who uh, is just, he's not a preacher. At his little church there in Georgia, it's smaller than this, I think. Since their campaign last year, they've had 20 baptisms. You know why? They send cards to people, they ask what they like to have a Bible study. And that's it. That's it. They actually believe it will work, and so they do it. We don't do it because why? We don't believe it will work. It's as simple as that. It's just as simple as that. And so because of that, we, we become the many instead of the few who say, help my unbelief. You know, I kept writing on my list here, visiting people, following up with contacts, door knocking. I want to share with you one one thing that hopefully we can do here sometime. And it's as easy as this. If I were to give you a piece of paper and I would say, I want you to write down the names of anybody you know who has maybe had a death in the family or had surgery of some kind or is having a difficult time with their job. Anybody that you know and write their name down and give us their address. And let's send them 50 cards. And then go to their house and say, hey, we're from the congregation that sent you these cards. What do you think about that congregation? What do you think they would say? They would say, oh, I hate those guys. No, they would say, no one's ever sent me 50 cards before. And you just say, hey, would you like to know more about the church? Guess what you did right then? If they're willing, you have scored a Bible study with them, 90% success rate. How many of you in here, how many names do you think we could come up with in 15 minutes if we just sat and thought about all the people that need prayers and we sent them a card about, I just said, you're having a surgery, I'm praying for your recovery. You just lost your husband, I know this is a difficult time, I've been praying for your loss. But we don't do these things because we don't believe it. But they work. What about mentoring? Any of you older people in here, are you living as a recluse or are you purposing yourself to be a mentor? You could transform somebody's life if you will come out of your house and hang out with a young person. If you're not, it's because you don't believe that you can. You need to, you need to ask God to challenge your unbelief. What about family worship? What about the influence on your family? What about saving up money and time like Sebastian does and like some of the others do to come and to equip themselves? 
I cannot tell you how many times in 13 years I have invited people and invited people and invited people to come and to be equipped, to be equipped for the work of ministry, Ephesians chapter 4. And they say, no, I can't go, I gotta work. And I can't go, I gotta work. Can't go, I gotta work. I can't go, I gotta work. And then, and then, they go on vacation to Disney World or something. I don't want to think about how many times that's happened since I've been here. Because someone will not purpose themselves to equip themselves, but they'll entertain themselves. And you know what? They're spiritually immature because of it. They could have grown if they believed God. But they didn't believe God. And so they said, well, I can only do, I can't, I can't do. And so they don't sacrifice and they don't make time and they make excuses. And they stay spiritually infantile because they do not believe that God can equip them and can transform their life and can make them a warrior for the cross. That's on my list. And what about sending your kids? Sending your kids to get equipped. You know, BJ's about to go to preaching school. How many of you are, are encouraging young people to go and to just be equipped? You know, they can go to preaching school. And that, that doesn't mean they have to be a preacher. But you know what? They'll, they'll be equipped. He'll be equipped to be an elder. He'll be equipped to be a, a, a Christian father and a deacon, perhaps. He'll be a, a, a faithful Christian husband. Because we encouraged equipping. Because we made that a priority rather than sports or rather than extracurricular activities, or, or things that in eternity are not going to matter one bit. And you know why we didn't do it? It's because we didn't believe God. We didn't believe that God could actually bring transformation within my child. Oh, they're fine just the way they are. What? My marriage is fine just the way it is. Oh, me? Just fine just the way I am. And so we, we say we believe what we're part of the many, instead of the few who say to, to the Lord, increase my faith. What about striving for a holy life? Cutting out all of the things of your life that are evil, that are an offense to God, that are demonic. God says that when you trust enough to invest, that He brings the increase. Refusing to go all in with what God has said to do is really saying that you know better than God you don't believe God. You don't trust God. My brother had to go to a, a cardiologist this past week. He's having some heart problems. We don't know what it is. Please pray for him. Well, what if he went to a cardiologist? And the cardiologist said, you know, I'm a cardiologist. I've never really been to school. I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm a cardiologist. How many people would die at the hands of that cardiologist? All of them, probably, right? And yet we are Christians, we are Christians, and we say, I'm a Christian, and my duty is to bring the gospel to people. But I've actually, you know what? I've never, I've never really been trained how to do it. I don't really know what I'm doing. How many people are going to go to hell? Because we just didn't take the opportunity to train ourselves. Rebecca was supposed to go with us on this trip. And I told her before we went, I said, your brain's going to be taken out. And she said, what? It's going to be clean. I said, no, they're going to put a new brain inside your head. You're going to be transformed. She couldn't go for whatever reason. And I was really discouraged because of that. And for every single one of you in here, you do not know what you do not know. You, you have to witness it for yourself. You have to participate in it for yourself. We have Christians who are heart surgeons who have never trained how to do any sort of thing with a heart. And we have people around us who are not being converted and we wonder why. Because we say we believe, but we haven't confronted our unbelief. Anyone that doesn't go on these evangelism trainings, there's going to be three next year. There's going to be one in Texas. And I'm telling you something. I may not be here. I'm telling you something. You do not know what you do not know. You need to go. There's a congregation 
that is paying for their entire group, their entire congregation to go to polishing the pulpit. They deem it that important of an investment, not because they have a lot of money, because they believe that God can transform them. You need to go get trained. You do not know what you are lacking. And you need to look within yourself and say, Lord, confront my unbelief. I have not allowed you to transform me. Don't ever look around wondering why things aren't better than they should be. Or why more people aren't being converted than they should be. If you do not believe God enough to let Him train and transform you within the brotherhood. I do not know how to be more direct than that. And probably for maybe someone else who hasn't been at a congregation 13 years. And perhaps may not be moving soon. Some people might get fired for being this direct. But we've got to know the truth about this. Lives are on the line. People in your life, maybe your sibling or maybe your spouse, will be lost for eternity because you never learned how to just have a Bible study with them. Confront your unbelief. Believe what God has said. Believe what God has said. I want to end, I want to end this morning by quoting my roommate on my first mission trip in Nicaragua. Scott Broughton. He went to preaching school for a couple of years in his 50s. And the man has been to prison before. They wouldn't let him into preaching school. They had to get other people to vouch for him. No, he's okay. He, can, he goes to preaching school for two years. Immediately gets out, goes to American Samoa for two years. And he doesn't like the heat, and it's hot there. And now he's back in the States. Within the first 24 hours of knowing him, he gave us a little talk, a little devotional. And here's what he said. He said, there were three frogs on a log. And one of the logs decided, excuse me, one of the frogs decided to jump off the log. How many frogs are on the log? How many frogs are there? There's still three. Deciding to do something is not the same as doing it. Saying, I believe, I'm a Christian, is not the same as saying, Lord, confront my unbelief and jumping off. It is not the same. I wanted to share with you the numbers this morning. It's projected that the church will be dead by 2059 or 2069. That's within my lifetime. That the church will be dead. That's the decrease in the number of people within the church right now. And it's right on pace for what has been projected. And it will die. It will die because there are well-intending believers who say, that sounds like a good idea. And they just sit right there on that log and don't do anything. Even though they know better. But they didn't jump off because they really didn't believe. I love you all dearly. Your soul is on the line. And the people you love, their souls are on the line. And it's, it's time for do away with child games and be serious about believing God. Jesus died for us. He shed His blood because He loves you. And when we say, Lord, I believe, guess what? We have, we have, we have entrusted ourselves to God and said, I want you to take full ownership of me. Do as you please. If that's not your way of thinking, if, you're, if your mind and your heart says, I'm fine just the way that I am. That sermon was a bit too direct. Then I would, I would ask you to look within. And just as these with Jesus say, I believe, but there's evidence in my life that I really don't believe. Help my unbelief. 
Perhaps you're not a Christian. Jesus died for you. You can be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you'll believe that He's Lord and give your life to Him, He wants nothing more than to give you the abundant life and to save your soul and to give you a purpose in life that you didn't have before and to give you a mission in life that is the most important and profound mission that exists to bring other people to heaven with you. Perhaps that's interesting to you, but you don't know. You want to talk about it. You may want to study about it. I would love to sit down and talk with you about it. And we can talk about what you must do to become a Christian. Perhaps you're sitting here thinking, well, my head is kind of spinning and I don't know what to think now. Come talk to me. It's important for us to confess to one another our lives as we look within and see the different areas that betray our unbelief. I need to betray, I need to confront the unbelief in my life. And we can do that for each other. Brother Surrey's going to lead us in a song of encouragement. If there's anything we can pray about for you today, right now, or help encourage you in some way to revitalize your faith and to truly believe, we want to help you in any way. If you have a need, please come as we stand and sing this song.